great day to be alive hallelujah it's exciting times that we live in see it's all in your perception isn't it <laughs> it's all in how you see it amen so we welcome our guests and at the end of service we're going to let those that brought uh, family or friends just introduce them so we know because we just want to honor honor them that we have guests today praise God so God is good we have a wonderful dinner today for you when we're done. And so we got a few things to do. And first we're going to release the word and then we're just going to continue to walk through this day. And the children at the end also have a little uh, presentation and a couple things we have to do. So, you know, we gather one time on a Sunday, right? And so we make it count. <laughs> we get everything done that needs to get done. Praise God, right? And so we just let the Holy Spirit have his way. So we're going to go to John 20 first. So we walk the word here. If you're visiting, we walk the Bible. The word of God is living and it's alive and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces, it divides, soul and spirit. Praise God. It goes down into the marrow of us. And, and so it can see the things. You know, we know the word is Jesus and... But we want to talk about the power of resurrection today. So we know this is Passover season and, and we celebrate all of those things. And we just are so excited for this season because we're entering into a new season and a new place in the Lord. And so John chapter 20. And so Holy Spirit, we just thank you for this word today. I ask that you would uh, speak through these lips of clay today, Father, a word that would touch hearts, transform lives. I, I pray that the seed of God goes down deep into the hearts and produces an abundant harvest this day. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. In John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. And saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together. And the other disciple ran faster than Peter and came into the tomb first. And stopping and looking in, he said, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. So Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face, face cloth, which had been on his head, was lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb, also entered, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the other disciples went away again to their own homes, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw the two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and to your Father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came, uh, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Hallelujah. He is risen. Amen. He is alive. And you note when he rose until he said her name, she didn't recognize or discern Jesus. See, the Bible says that his sheep know his voice. 
and a stranger's voice they will not follow. And so when we're born again and we're grafted in, we know his voice. And when he speaks our name, we can hear him. And so when, she, when Jesus released his name, her eyes were open. And so we know that the resurrection of Jesus is a fulfillment of the first fruits of salvation, redemption, and deliverance. That's why it is a celebration. That's why you, you won't find Jesus hanging on a cross because he's alive. Amen. He is risen. And so I'm going to give you some, some points or some things about the resurrection and what it means to you as a child of God. All right. And so number one, the resurrection of Jesus means that we are justified before God. That's good news, isn't it? You are justified as a child of the kingdom. In Romans chapter 4, now, some of these I have written out and some will go to. This one I have written out, but you can write these down. Romans chapter 4, 24 and 25 says, But for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and also raised because of our justification. And so the word justification means to uh, put right, to put right. It means that when we were separated by sin from God, because we know sin separates us, right? That's why Jesus had to come, to reconcile us back to the Father. So it says that we were separated by sin from God. We were objects of his wrath, incapable of a relationship with Jesus, with God. Because Jesus was the one that is the, the middle ground. He's, he's the mediator between God and man, right? And so his resurrection gave us justification. That's, that's exciting if you really get the depths of what God is saying. So in the death of Jesus, God put our punishment on him, right? See, he paid for our sin, right? He paid for our sin. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. And so he, became, he, he took on our punishment so that we could be justified before God. Hallelujah. So when Jesus arose, it confirmed that God accepted Christ's sacrifice for sin. Because he arose. God was pleased with that. And so when, when he arose, that's what it means. And it gives us access to a right relationship with the Father. And so without resurrection, there is no power. There's no power. If Jesus would have stayed in the ground dead, we would have no hope. That's why we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Amen? And so the second thing is the resurrection of Jesus demonstrates that Jesus defeated death. Let's go to Romans 6. See, he defeated death. And guess what? As a child of God, you have defeated death. We all have an earthly death, but we have an eternal life. And so we are eternal spirits according to the word of God. Romans 6, verse 9. It says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Okay, Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. He said, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so we know that's even the symbol that we have for water baptism, right? We, we die, we are buried, and then we're washed, we're resurrected into new life in Christ. That's what that means. That's why we do baptism, amen? And so I know some of you know these things, but this is Resurrection Sunday, so we're going to understand deeply what, what God is saying to us in the resurrection. So only Jesus defeated death. Remember, he's the firstborn. Of the dead. He was the first to be what? Resurrection from the dead. And so he defeated death. So in Christ we have it. We don't have to fear death. That's why the Bible says we don't mourn like those that don't have hope. We know when our loved ones die in Christ they are alive. Hallelujah. Forevermore. 
And so I tell people that's a momentary separation. Momentary. Because in one blink of an eye, in a split second, I'm in another realm. Just like that. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? When you know the Lord. <laughs> when you know where you're going. So I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear any punishment that comes after death when I'm in Christ. Praise God for that. That's the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15. You can put a marker in there a few times. But verse 55 through 57 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Uh-huh. <laughs> he said, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. So we don't have to fear or dread death. Mm -hmm. We don't have to because we're in him. And we live forever with the Lord. Amen. And number three is the resurrection means I'm united with Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.14 says, Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us up also, right, with Jesus, and will present us with you. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. So that means that I am united with the Lord because of resurrection. Hallelujah. He had to go by way of the cross to redeem us. To redeem us out of sin bondage. And we receive the sacrifice. When we get born again, we receive that sacrifice that Jesus did for us. It's not about a denomination, right? It's not about any of those things. Because when we go, welcome Phil. When we go, <laughs> right on time. <laughs> you know, before the Father, guess what? We are redeemed. He's not going to ask us what church we go to. That's not even, that's not, he's not going to consider those things. Do we know the Lord? Do we really believe in the risen Lord? Amen. That's what he's going to, that's, that's the blood that we just celebrated Passover where death passes over us because we are born again by salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Good news right there. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's see, remember, we're united with him, right? So we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the marvelous light. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 says, But God, being rich in his mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He said, And he raised us up with him and seated us with him. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not as a result of works, so that no man can boast. You can't earn your way into heaven, <laughs> you can't do enough good works, you can't be nice enough. Come on. You, you, can't, you can't give to enough charities to get in. Nothing but Jesus. Nothing but him. Amen. And it says, and this is why he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You know why we can walk in good works? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Otherwise, all the works would be dead. See, resurrection is power. Mm -hmm. It's power. He, made, he gave us power to become sons through his death, burial, and his resurrection. Hallelujah. And so when it says that it means I'm united with him, resurrection made me united with Christ. So that in Ephesians, he says I'm seated now that word to be seated means that God sees me in company with Jesus. Okay? That means that, that I sat down when Jesus said, and we're going to read that, when he said it was finished and he sat down, guess what? We all sat down with him. Hmm. 
Yeah, set down together. The root word means I'm in union with Jesus because of resurrection power, okay? It means that I am an associate, I'm in companionship, I'm resemblance, I'm positioned. It means I'm, I'm, I'm complete. I dwell with Jesus in a spiritual place right now. Because I'm in him. Because he rose from the dead, we're seated with him in heavenly places, right? To be seated is to stay in a place of resurrection power. You need to hear that because, see, this place is a spiritual place. But what happens is we go through trials, we go through tribulations, we go through suffering sometimes in the earth. And the enemy of our soul always wants to pull us out of our seat of authority. He always wants us to question if we're really with God or not. If God is with me, why is all this stuff happening to me, right? But see, we stay in a position seated with him in victory, understanding that this resurrection power that he has given me, it doesn't change because I go through something. See, God doesn't yank us out of our seat. <laughs> he didn't do that. Praise God. We deserve it. <laughs> but because there's grace, he lets us stay seated there with him. But we have to stay there in the spirit, not in our soul, because God made us three parts. Y'all know that spirit, soul, and body. We teach that. And so our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions, many times, you know, we get, we get, our world gets rocked in our soul. Our emotions get out of order. Our mind begins to talk crazy to us. And we got to, we got to come out of that and stay in our seat. And see, we, ha we can do that because we have resurrection power because of Jesus. Amen? Yes. And so, we, and so Hebrews 1, 3 says, And Jesus is the radiance of his glory. Speaking, you want to know what the Father looks like? Look at Jesus. Come on. You want to know what the Father thinks about you? Look at Jesus. He came out of the Father and identified with us as humanity and walked this earth so he could sympathize with, uh, with us in weakness but without sin. Praise the Lord. That's why Jesus could resurrect because there was no sin in him. Hallelujah. And so he is the model. And it says, and Jesus is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, talking about the Father. Does the Father love me? Yes. God is love. He's not, he's not a punisher of his children. Okay, so when bad things come, the enemy is working somewhere. Or we're foolish sometimes. We do things we shouldn't do, right? And some of these things, you know, it's not always the devil. It's us making wrong choices. Thinking wrong kind of thoughts. And so we don't want to give place to the enemy. So we have to keep our mind in a right place. Amen. And so it says in Jesus. I'm trying to get through this one here. One three. He is the radiance of his glory. The exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. He said when he had made purification of sins. Me and when he, when he went on the cross. He made purification for the sins of the world, right? He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he, as he has inherited a more excellent name than them, <laughs> right? Praise the Lord. So he's saying to us that Jesus sat down, and guess what? That's where we're seated right now. And Jesus ever lives to make intercession for his church. That means Jesus is in a constant intercession. He's praying for the saints, the Bible says. He prays for us. He's still interceding for the world. Why? Because we're in the dispensation of grace. He still desires all men to be saved and none perish. That's the love of Jesus, right? It's, you know why the love of Jesus and the gospel is still working? Because of resurrection. <laughs> because of the power. 
Hallelujah. The fourth thing, the resurrection of Jesus confirms that the word of God is true. Hallelujah. It confirms it. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells within you. Good news, right? Psalm 16, 10 and 11 says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. He says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so it proves the word of God is truth. In Matthew 12, 38 through 39, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he says, an evil and adulterous generation craves a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. You remember the story of Jonah, right? For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster, so will the Son of Man, meaning Jesus, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was speaking to them and telling them, this is your sign. This is the truth. The resurrection shows that the word of God is truth. And he was telling them that. They were familiar with Jonah. And Jesus was already gave them a ton of signs, right? But they were trying to trick Jesus, as a religious spirit always does. And they were trying to get him to do a sign from heaven. Okay, and I believe that they were trying to do that because they were trying to tempt him to yield to their demands, but Jesus only did what his father told him to do. He didn't have to yield and prove himself to any man. He said, I'm going to show you by my death, burial, and my resurrection. That's your sign. And then he goes on and says, because they didn't believe they would be judged, and those that didn't believe in that would be damned. Okay, I mean, it was, it's harsh if you continue to read that chapter. And so the resurrection confirms the truth of God's word. And so number five, the resurrection of Jesus proves the gospel to be true. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. It proves the gospel is true. Hallelujah. In verse 1, it says, and this is Paul, he's talking and, and he's trying to prove to the Corinthian church about the resurrection. They didn't believe in these things. It says, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received in which you stand. He said, by which also you were saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, for I delivered to you as the first importance that I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. He said, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and all the apostles. And last of all, he said, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. You know the story when he got knocked off his horse, right? <laughs> On the road to Damascus, he, he came down and spoke to him. And so he, we're saying, we're, you know, painting this for you. It proves the gospel. The fact that he is alive means today that he is still able to save, he's able to deliver, and he's still able to heal and do miracles. And we see those, don't we? That's the proof of the gospel, the resurrection Lord, because we see his power. And everybody in this room that knows the Lord has experienced it. If Christ had not been raised, Paul is saying preaching is vanity. If Christ has not been raised, there would be no salvations today. There would be no transformed lives today. There would be nobody getting delivered, nobody getting healed today. <laughs> you see, so it's proof, amen, that he is alive. And so all those that have died in faith could not be raised back to life. You notice Paul said they fell asleep. You know, they fell asleep. And we as Christians, I, I try always to say that someone transitioned. 
I don't even say died. And when I do say that, I pull it back because they transition into another place. But they are alive. Because they're alive. George and I have a son we will see, and I believe they, they age. I believe they age, and I don't know how, how long they age, but even though he, he passed away at three months, when I have a vision of him or when I see him, he's a young man. You know, so he would be like, what, 31 today with Jesus. You see that? It's how, what you believe, right? Because even if you don't believe it, it is fact and you will see it someday. Amen. So all those that have died in faith could not be raised back to life if it was not so. They would have perished. But Hebrews says that there is a cloud of witnesses that surround us. Mm -hmm. See, the spiritual realm, even though in the natural now you can see one another, but if God would lift the veil, and we did have some visions in here today in prayer, praise the Lord, right? When God lifts the veil and you begin to see in the spirit, you could see the angels. You could see even the cloud of witnesses. You can see those, okay? They're real. They're alive. Go to verse 17. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, he says, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sin. He said, then those who have been fallen asleep in Christ, they have perished. He said, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are all, he said, men most to be pitied. He's like, if this is it, that's pitiful. <laughs> True, right? If this earthly life is all there is, there's something else. God is alive. Hallelujah. There's great things. And so the resurrection is the glue. Because Jesus resurrected, it's like the glue that holds every promise together for us. That's a promise. Because he rose again, I can get set free. Because he rose again, I can receive miracles. I can be healed because he rose. And because he rose, guess what? I can have an eternal vision. I can have a hope and a peace because he showed the way. So without the resurrection, we'll be believing in vain, he said, and we don't have hope. So since he's risen, we have hope of our sins that they are forgiven. Amen. We don't have to question that. So if you're in here and you question, did God really forgive me? If you repented, guess what? It's washed. Because the Bible says he throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. Jesus does not go fishing for your dirty sins. If he said he chose to forgive them, he chose, and that's Micah 7, he washes us, right? Now, we don't continue to sin that grace abounds. He, he, you know, Paul said, God forbid, don't do that. Even when Jesus delivered people and healed them, what did he say many times? He says, your sins are forgiven. Now go and sin no more. Grace. See, grace empowers me to walk with Jesus. This resurrection power, it empowers me to live a holy life. It helps me to say no to sin. Amen? Because we know when we open the door to those things that the devil is coming and he's, he will torment me and condemn me. That's why we walk in the blood of Jesus, under the blood, and we let God cleanse us. Amen? And so, since Jesus has risen, we have hope of ourselves being forgiven, and we have been made righteous, and we have eternal life. And that's settled. All right? Number six, the resurrection proves that Jesus is the Son of God. And that scripture is Romans 1, 3, and 4. It says, concerning his son who was born a descent of David, according to the flesh, speaking of Jesus, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> Proof. He is a son because he was raised from the dead. Amen. Number seven. The resurrection of Jesus proves that Holy Spirit will be poured out into the hearts of those who believe. You remember at the end when Jesus was ascending, he tells his disciples before Acts 1, in the end of the uh, Gospels, he tells them to wait and tarry. There's a promise coming to you. He said, I must go so the Holy Spirit can come. 
See, he said he's going to come and he and you're going to do greater things because the spirit of God is not bound by one body like me. Come on. <laughs> Jesus was the son of God and the spirit of God. He walked in the fullness of the spirit, but he was one man. That's why he had to impart to the 12 and just release all through the earth. And the Holy Spirit has no boundaries. Praise the Lord. That's how we can pray for somebody far away and they get healed. That's how we can decree a thing and it can be established and we're not even there. <laughs> Faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, right? And so Jesus had to go. It, it proves that the Holy Spirit, and we know in Acts 2, 33, when Christ ascended and, and power was released in those first two chapters, the birth of the church, it says, therefore, Acts 2, 33, having been exalted to the right hand of God, speaking of Jesus, where we're seated, right? And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth, he said, this which you both see and hear. So they saw and they heard when the Holy Spirit came and entered uh, the disciples in the 120 in the upper room, there was power. There was a demonstration. They saw signs and they began to speak in other languages, right? And, and people were gathering because it was a special feast, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost feast. And in the Bible, they all came and gathered from all around. That's why it says that the, the people in that region heard the gospel of Jesus in their own tongue because they were gathered for a feast. <laughs> and they came and the Holy Spirit was poured out. So they got to see and hear and, and was demonstrated that the power of God was released and that Jesus was resurrected. Hallelujah. That's for us today and is here now. And so because of the resurrection, I receive power and the anointing. You know, the anointing on your life is because he rose. If he would have stayed in the ground, there would be no power. <laughs> and we have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. If we're saved, we have access to the power and the presence of the Lord. You are marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit when you become saved. Amen then you, you can receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, the infilling. You see that? It's beautiful, isn't it? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for, right, for, for living a sinless life and paying the price. Amen? Number eight, resurrection gives us a living hope. Let's go to 1 Peter. You want to know somebody that don't have hope? Somebody that don't have the Spirit of God within them. Because when you know the Lord, it's to have hope. When you know Jesus, there is eternal vision. There is, some, there is some peace inside of me. In 1 Peter 1, no matter what happens in the earth, we have a living hope. Verse 3, it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's why you have a hope. <laughs> He said, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You know why you have an inheritance? Because Jesus rose. You know why you have a treasure laid up for you? Because Jesus resurrected. Amen. And so our vision is eternal. Because of the resurrection, we have an eternal vision. Number nine, resurrection is our guarantee of our personal let's go back to first corinthians resurrection all right personal sometimes when people are not always but you know we've ministered to people that were crossing over and and the enemy will come you know when things are just at that place sometimes and we get them to doubt you know am i ready or you know they start the enemy can sometimes torment people when they're transitioning you know, and there's been times where, you know, I've had to minister to people, uh, a hospice and all of those things. And, and there's times God does raise people and they, and they don't die, right? He does raise people and they get more years. But there's times when it's their time and they must transition. 
And we've had to give them hope and encouragement and remind them of the word, the word of God. So when the devil comes at you to get you to doubt and to struggle, you put the word on it. The word is truth. It will never change for any man. I don't care what kind of laws are created in the earth realm. The word of God is what we're judged by. It's the word of God. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Okay? He said, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, he said, So also in Christ we all will be made alive. But each in his own state. Christ the first fruits, he said, after all those who are Christ at his coming. So he says, when the end comes, look, he said, you will be, you will rise again. Amen? You will rise again. And so they always use the word asleep when you're in Christ. You're just sleeping. <laughs> and to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? Hallelujah. So... For as by a man came death, a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And go to verse 42 in the same chapter. It says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. You remember when Jesus resurrected, okay, when you go back and read that, when he resurrected in his resurrected body, and so when Mary came to him and he says, don't cling to me, it didn't mean she couldn't touch him. It meant she wanted him to stick around. <laughs> she wanted him to stay. She was so excited he was alive. Okay, and so and he had to go to be with his father and, and do what he had to do, and, and the Holy Spirit had to come. He's like, don't, don't cling yet, you know. And so when you see that, it says that raised an imperishable body. Jesus ate. He went and he, they, his, in his glorified body, he ate some fish. He cooked some food. And you know what else he did? He walked through walls. Come on now. God is supernatural. He just would appear. The doors were locked. And Jesus shows up. And they're like, what? glorified body a little different than this earthly body isn't it uh -huh. there's no limitations when we get this glorified body and you notice he said flesh and bone okay there wasn't no blood because he poured out his blood in a glorified body you don't need earthly blood he still had a physical body they recognized him as Jesus he ate he walked through walls he disappeared some of y'all quiet. Why? Because we're too low. God is supernatural. And so how can a supernatural spirit be in these earthly tents and we not see supernatural things? Right? And so when you get your glorified body, you're going to get hungry. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're going to want to eat, but you're going to get hungry. And you're going to be able to do some things, Right? And I do believe heaven operates on thoughts. I do believe we can think a thing and we're there. We can, I believe all that, just like Jesus. See, Jesus is our model. You don't have to go looking for another model. It is him. Okay? As he is, so are we. Come on now. All right. I was going somewhere. 42. Okay. Okay. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. He's talking about our earthly versus our spiritual man. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. He said if there is a natural body, then there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, but the last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit, speaking of Jesus. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly, but the second man is from heaven. He said, as it is earthly, so also those who are earthly. And as it is heavenly, so also those who are heavenly. 
just as we have been born the image of the earthly, we also bear the image of the heavenly through our salvation because he resurrected. <laughs> Selah. So number 10, I'm almost done. The resurrection also tells us that Christ will judge the world in righteousness. Let's go to Acts 17. But see, when we're in Christ, we don't got to fear that day. Thank you, Jesus, right? We will be judged as a Christian by our works, whether good or bad. We will. We got to give an account of our behavior of our life. Acts 17, he's going to say, I gave you some stuff. What would you do with it? That's what he's going to say. 1730 says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, he said, God is now declaring to all men that all people everywhere should repent. He said, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, speaking of Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There you go again. And it says, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, we shall hear of this. We shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst. So he's preaching, he's, he's sharing, and he's telling them, look, God is going to judge the world because this man, Jesus, rose from the dead. Then he is a witness. So all the world will be judged for the things they have done and they will be held accountable before God. And so believers also are held accountable for the good, good or bad works. So we're thankful for what? The blood of Jesus that washes us, that forgives us. Amen? Closing. John eleven twenty five 25 and 26. It says, I am the resurrection and the life. You remember when Jesus was talking uh, to when Lazarus died and they were weeping and crying Mary and Martha was crying because their brother had died and Jesus says didn't you know I am the resurrection and the life and she's like yeah we know you know at the end you're going to raise us up and she's like no now I am now the resurrection and the life he said whoever believes in me though he die yet shall he live and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he said, do you believe this? Hmm. Do you believe this? And so today we need to what? Examine our hearts today. We need to ask the Lord. If you're in here and you have never been born again. So I want your intercessors to be praying. If you have never received Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Because see everybody, there's going to be a resurrection. Okay, there's going to be a resurrection. There's going to be a day when everybody has to stand before God. Whether you know Jesus or not, the Bible says what? Every knee will bow, right? Every tongue confess it, that Jesus is Lord. Everybody will do that. And so in Romans chapter 10, it says in verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth, he said, and in your heart, that is the word of faith, which we are preaching. He says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he says you will be saved. For with your heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he will confess, resulting in salvation. See, everybody has to confess the Lord for themselves. I can't confess for my sister and get her into heaven. You can't do that. Everyone has to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. He said, for scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. He said, there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, for the same Lord is Lord over all, abounding in riches for all who call on him, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so if you're here today, we're going to just go ahead and do that. If you're here today and you have never uh, received Christ as your Savior, you've never asked him to come into your life, you've never made a confession that Jesus is Lord, we, want to, we can pray with you to do that. If you're here today and you have never asked God to forgive you and to wash you of your sin, 
You know, it's the greatest miracle you will ever, ever receive. It is the beginning of real life. Amen. It is the beginning of new life. It's the greatest miracle. And so if you're here today and you have never received Christ today, we just want to welcome you to come. And we will uh, minister to you today and just lead you in a simple prayer. It's actually the word of God. The word I just read to you today. In Jesus' name. So we thank you, Lord. We bless you in this place. Anything at all. If you're in here and you need, you need healing in your body, I'll have the uh, leaders where you come. If you need healing in your body, we will pray for you. Vicky, come on, y'all. Elder Larry, if you have any prayer needs at all, sickness in your body, personal prayer, if there's something that you need, you're welcome to come forward and we'll pray for you. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. Hallelujah, we thank you. God is good.